And we'd like to welcome all of you to the Bayou Culture uh, gathering for today. We've got our special guest. We're really happy to have uh, Liz Russell with us today, who is the state director for the Louisiana Environmental Defense Fund. Some of y'all may um, know Liz for uh, her work with the LA Safe program when she was with Foundation for Louisiana. Um, tremendous work, uh, tremendous woman who's with us today. So um, we'll be hearing from her a little bit uh, later with her talk, Mapping Policy Mitigation and Adaptation in Louisiana. Of course, uh, the team that brings this program to you um, each month, myself, Ms. Maida Owens, uh, Dr. Rachel, Dr. Gary, um, we are um, thankful. It's such a wonderful group of people to work with um, to bring this program to you. Um, so this is sort of our disclaimer slide that we don't have um, all of the answers, nor do we support any one adaptation strategy, but this is more a forum to uh, discuss some of those issues and gain a little bit more knowledge about what's happening. Our partners um, here, the Louisiana Folklore Society, Center for Bayou Studies, Folklife in Louisiana, Center for Louisiana Studies, and the Wetlands Discovery Center. And then of course, thank you to our funders who make these programs uh, possible for all of you, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, BETNEP and uh, Louisiana Office of Cultural Development through the Division of the Arts. And I'd now like to uh, pass the microphone on to Ms. Maida Owens to talk a little bit about the Passing It On workshops. Yeah, I'm really excited about uh, the Passing It On workshops. Uh, we've completed all for this year and we'll be starting up again uh, probably in late fall or uh, in the spring. Uh, next slide. This week, uh, this month, I want to feature Diana Donnell uh, Mason. Uh, she does uh, chair caning, and she taught a great group at uh, in St. Martinville at Longfellow Evangelion State Park. They've been a great partner and have actually hosted quite a few of these. Diana is uh, in business. She this is her what she does, and this is actually one of the more endangered programs. I, I over the years, I've often gotten calls asking about if I know anybody who does caning. And I have always had to say no, but out of the blue, Diana called me and said, I'd like to participate in this program. And so we worked it out. No, that's wonderful. And you know, um, for all of you on the call, if there are certain traditions that you are looking for a tradition bearer to either discuss or need help with, for example, repairing um, a chair that may be have some sentimental value to you. Please reach out to Meta because that's what that's what I do almost on a weekly basis. People will call me and say, "Hey," and in fact, it was about the chair caning. Um, do you know anybody who does that? And I send them to Meta, and inevitably, she always has uh, someone who can help us out. So thank you so much for that, Maida. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I have a database of all the tradition bearers that have ever interacted with the program. And that it's a list of about 2000 people now after, since 1979. And so many of them have passed away or I haven't lost contact with them, but I might be able to find out, find the person you need. Yeah, no, it's a huge resource. And I saw uh, Karen Leatham with uh, Louisiana State Museum um, is with us today. So Karen, that could be a great resource for you as well. I know that you are often looking for some information like that, so that could be helpful. Um, so today, here is our agenda. We've got um, Ms. Liz Russell with us. Uh, we'll be listening to her in just a second. We'll have some time for question and answers, um, a discussion with her if there are anything, if there if there's anything that you'd like to discuss with her, we'll ask her what her hope for the coast is. And then we'll talk a little bit about the position statement, working groups, if anybody has any announcements. And then of course, the formal part of this presentation ends um, at one o'clock, but we like to have everybody stick around if you can until 1.30 um, to have an informal discussion. So with no further ado, it is uh, gives me great joy to introduce to all of you a dear friend of mine, um, Ms. Liz Russell, uh, with her talk today, Mapping Policy, Mitigation, and Adaptation in Louisiana. Liz, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, thank you to the Bioculture Collaborative for having me, um, for inviting me to be a part of this space. Um, I want to 
Uh, just first acknowledge the wealth of expertise that's already on the call when I'm looking through the participant list, a lot of old uh, friends and colleagues there and really appreciate all of the leadership of everyone who is who is participating and trying to carry on all of the traditions for Louisiana and center all of our communities and how we um, continue to exist, work, thrive, have a great time in the state, <laughs> whatever that looks like. Um, uh, I know a number of folks on this call in my previous role, as Jonathan mentioned, um, I've been at Environmental Defense Fund for about 15, somewhere between 15, 18 months now. Um, I was brought over to EDF, which is a giant global uh, organization, environmental advocacy organization uh, that works on a wide range of issues. Uh, EDF uh, has mostly in Louisiana worked in the context of coastal restoration historically um, and in the context of coastal restoration and supporting Louisiana fisheries. Um, uh, EDF has been here for decades. Uh, that said, there's a wealth of expertise that has not really um, been, been accessible to Louisianans in the state for a long time, and that ranges from um, greenhouse gas mitigation like methane uh, or addressing our orphaned well challenge, um, carbon capture, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, insurance, uh, which is a challenge I know we're all uh, facing in our state. Um, petrochemicals, environmental justice, the list could go on and on. Um, but I just want to start with sharing candidly that my role uh, is not to be a sort of technical expert on any one of those areas, uh, but to be uh, the political uh, sort of and local manager of that work and how that work actually gets deployed on the ground in Louisiana. So myself, my colleague, Bria Calvin, um, and uh, uh, even a, a summer intern, Madison Smither, uh, this year have, have been working really uh, intentionally with a lot of different uh, sections of Environmental Defense Fund to try to advance environmental and climate policy work in Louisiana. Uh, we do that uh, both um, by engaging in rulemakings at the state level and engaging directly with state agencies or participating in their public comment processes. Um, we do that in legislative advocacy, we have gotten involved in elections already. We expect to be expanding some of that work. Um, but really, uh, my hope is to uh, center always the needs of Louisiana people, of us as Louisiana communities, in how we can advance um, uh, and strengthen environmental policy in the state of Louisiana. Um, so I actually want, uh, and I realize some folks on this call are going to be like, Liz, I've seen this a million times, <laughs> or I was a part of that work. Um, and I also recognize there are new folks and, and folks that have stepped into certain roles. So um, I want to start with just a reminder of where we are in the context of our national um, water ecosystem, uh, that everything from the Rocky Mountains to Appalachia is drained through our state. Um, it is just such an extraordinary thing to understand the scale of the Mississippi River Basin. And for those of us that live along the river or along her historic distributaries and tributaries, it is just really powerful for me um, to always remember the scale of the sort of natural environment that we're a part of. It's also important to recognize the scale at which Louisiana has to or gets to um, deal with the mud and dirt and runoff from kind of everywhere else in the country in lots of different um, real and metaphorical ways. Um, so we'll talk more about that. I also want to remind us um, about the history of how Southern Louisiana came to be and the history of that river system. Um, you know, the Mississippi River's purpose is to get to open water by the shortest, fastest route available, right? And historically, the river used to overflow its banks uh, in spring floods and deposit new layers of mud and sand and sediment, um, and then uh, build land until it found a shorter, faster route to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so this set of diagrams for me is, is really powerful to always keep in mind uh, as a reminder that we live in a historically dynamic and changing system where there was always growth and there was always decline and um, humans had to navigate how to exist in that dynamic world. Um, and indigenous peoples were much more comfortable, I think, than we, we were today, we are today with how to navigate and, and sort of support and live within the confines of a dynamic, um, fertile um, giving system. You know, uh, so 
I want to pivot there because as many of the group the folks on this call know we have levied off the river following colonization um, for decades for generations for centuries um, and we have managed the river now where it is forced to go down uh, the route where all of the sediment goes off the continental shelf into the gulf of mexico um, and then we have also allowed pervasive oil and gas development and uh, pervasive channelization of the river and allowing for pipelines and canals that just crisscross and cut apart those wetlands that have led us to the land loss condition where we are today, which I wanna to circle to. Um, and at the same time, we have overlaid those landscapes uh, with conditions of uh, an economy uh, that is based on how we value uh, people, how we value land, how we value culture. Um, and so I, I have this map of redlining in New Orleans up here because I want to remind us that in the context of dealing with coastal land loss and coastal change, that these histories of making decisions about who gets access to what resources, who has the access to uh, the GI Bill when they come home from fighting for uh, fighting in World War II, who has access uh, to investments in infrastructure um, and maintenance of that infrastructure, the way in which redlining prioritized uh, uh, mortgage mortgages available to white residents over black residents. All of that is really present in the condition that we're dealing with today and today's policy landscape. Um, I want to show uh, this image of uh, the 2023 coastal master plan. Uh, this is the future with action. So with the investment of the coastal master plan and uh, with higher levels of sea level rise with uh with the flood depths illustrated right so the the lighter blues are more shallow waters uh the brighter reds and oranges are the more deep waters um, and so this is with full uh investment in the coastal master plan we still expect to see a really significant increases in our flood risk um, over time and so i want to keep that in mind i also want to remind us that this map actually illustrates uh, the extent to which the coastal master plan sees less risk um, than if we don't invest in the coastal master plan. So uh, this is a benefit, um, the areas with more darker browns, it's, it means that there's less risk than there would be if we weren't investing in the coastal master plan, right? Um, and so it's really important for us to both grapple with the fact that we are as a state making investments to restore the dynamic nature of the coast, to reconnect the river to her delta, to um, mitigate flood risk to our communities, um, especially for the larger population centers. Um, and um, even with full investment in the coastal master plan, we're still um, gonna see more flood risk and more uh, saltwater intrusion and more coastal land loss than we've experienced today. Um, I want to illustrate uh, the population movement a bit that's already occurring, and, and I don't have to tell anybody across the Bayou region this, right? Um, this is all something we've, we've seen and experienced um, in our own lives, uh, but in areas where uh, we've seen disaster after disaster, um, residents who have the resources both financially and with the social networks to do so are moving to what they perceive as higher and safer grounds. Right, um, and then uh, there are ripple effects across that spectrum. So where folks are leaving communities, there are less tax revenues and less resources to pay to maintain social services, um, maintain roads or infrastructure systems. Um, at the same time, there might be schools shutting down. I know this is true in Terrebonne or lack of access to healthcare services, more challenging in Plaquemines. Um, it really varies across the coast, but there are some consistent things. Um, and then in those areas growing in population, we see schools over capacity or traffic swelling, and we see new development being permitted without any regard for where water might actually go in the future. Um, so I, I wanna turn here now, I wanna talk very briefly about the LA Safe process, because um, even though it was six years ago, this is a really foundational uh, piece for me in how we as a, as a region and as a state center communities in um, in planning for the future and in that spectrum of conditions. Um, it wasn't perfect. It could have been better, you know, all of the things. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge that like 
over the course of these 10 months, having more than 70 public meetings that went back and forth from parish level meetings to small community meetings, smaller roundtables and stakeholder conversations, um, conversations in some cases that were led by people on this call, right, as table hosts, um, and participants of the Lead the Coast program of the Foundation for Louisiana. Um, that as a region, we did take steps to invest in asking ourselves um, what what do we want, what do we love about our place? How do we support our community and our culture, our economy and our jobs, our environment and sustainability? And how do we do that with an acknowledgement of the risk and an acknowledgement that our dynamic system continues to be dynamic and we will continue to see change? And how do we do that in a way that centers the investments we need to make to live thriving lives in Louisiana uh, it, it, across that array of communities. Um, I want to remind us that throughout those 10 months, we got to uh, this this giant crowdsourced land use planning map, which I, I love, right? These are ideas from residents across the coast that are all on one map. Um, and, and the ideas for projects or programs or policy recommendations, this is residents going like, I've already seen land loss in my community. I know what this looks like. I know I want access you know, I, I think about a, an idea that some might characterize as a not good idea or maybe not viable idea in South Plaquemines Parish where somebody said to me, Liz, I just want, I want to be able to get a cup of coffee and I don't want to have to drive an hour to get produce, right? Like I would like a Starbucks inside of a Target right there. I don't need to get into the whole range of decisions that gets to a place of why Target is not investing um, in Venice, a new, a new Target with a Starbucks. Uh, but but the crux of what that person wanted was like not to have to drive an hour to get produce and um, to be able to stay in their community and to be able to have access to the things that they loved and the people that they cherish um, and to to be able to adapt and live with with the changing conditions and the increase in water. Um, you know, over over the course of that 10 months, right, uh, the state eventually invested in 10 projects that were voted on by residents in these meetings. Um, so you had an array of investments. You had a uh, the Bayou Region Incubator. I see somebody on the call that came from this process. Um, uh, the resilient housing uh, uh, that could actually accommodate floodwaters and was designed uh, to be off of distributed solar generation instead of depending on a power facility that might be miles away, as we learned in Ida. Um, increased support for mental health care services in Plaquemines Parish, where people have lost, um, uh, there's been so much population movement outside of the parish, and, and people really need access to more mental health services. Um, a safe harbor for some of our fishermen uh, who are working to adapt to a whole myriad of challenges with uh, coastal change. Um, you know, for me, this this set of pictures just brings a lot of memories and joy um, because the the opportunity for so many residents to participate in in thinking through ideas and prioritizing ideas. You know, this picture um, in the middle right of where residents actually put forward colored tokens for their favorite projects, and we opened up those tubes at the end. I just I, I want to keep this fresh in my own brain because. Uh, these plans still exist and when I look back at them they're still really have a lot of valuable ideas and and for the most part they came directly from residents. Um, as we think about how we adapt and how we whether we adapt in place um, or whether we want to consider moving or whether uh, whatever whatever range of conditions that looks like I want to acknowledge um, that we're all considering our risk tolerances and our risk preferences. Right, like, um, yeah, I could move uh, to Michigan, right? I, I could move to North Dakota. Um, I don't want to live in Michigan or North Dakota. I don't want to be somewhere where it's too cold to snow sometimes. That is not a thing I knew existed, um, right? I'm, I'm learning about too hot to rain right now, right? But, but there's, there's this question for me. And I love these maps from the data center in New Orleans because um, they illustrate actually where people are statistically likely to move from one parish to another. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to switch. So um, what you see here is that uh, in these grayed out parishes, um, if everyone in Lafouche Parish had to move in those red areas in the middle of the page, um, where would they be likely to go? And what you see is a lot of folks go to New Orleans, a lot of folks go west, go to Morgan City, go to Lafayette, some go up to Shreveport in that bottom map, right? But 
um, people are going where they have family connections, where they have societal ties. Like we're drawn to the places that we already know. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's something as we think about um, planning and supporting Louisiana and adapting over time and carrying forward all of the things that we love in our communities and our culture. It's just really interesting for me. I, I just really wanna center the ways in which our family ties, our social networks, our ties to community are what help to drive us in thinking through these decisions about whether to stay or go or where and how and all, all of those different things. Um, you know, in uh, the LA Safe process, we talked a lot about in the areas expected to remain high and dry, how do we think really intentionally about how we grow in those areas? How do we grow in a way that's inclusive? How do we make sure there's affordable housing for folks? How do we um, think about uh, jobs and economic opportunity in the context of, of those growth areas and, and think about the types of transportation that people need. Um, how do we uh, stop making bad decisions, right? This actually ties back to our insurance crisis right now. Um, part of the reason we have insurers leaving the state of Louisiana is because we have reinsurers. That means um, the insurance companies for insurance companies who, who are based in London and Zurich and have no ties to Louisiana. And they're making decisions about our lives. They're making decisions about who gets to stay where because they're making decisions about who gets access to reinsurance. So how do we reduce the decision making, the permitting of new development in areas that we know are high flood risk? We do not need to be selling off properties to people to go experience flooding over and over and over again and allowing developers um, to just sell that land off putting granite countertops and stainless steel appliances and, and convince you that it's worth living there, right? Convince all of us that it's worth living there. So there's a lot of policy questions uh, in, in, in this set of conditions. And then in those areas already receiving um, huge influxes of population, how do we, again, think about uh, room for water, room for water where when it rains, it's raining a lot heavier, um, a lot more quickly, and our drainage systems just aren't designed to accommodate that much water. So what does that mean in areas uh, that, that were really impacted from the 2016 floods in the North Shore, in Baton Rouge, um, in Monroe, right? What does it mean to really think about water management at a watershed level? Um, and then how do we actually reduce long-term risk with, with with targeted investment um, so that elevations uh, and any any voluntary acquisitions or buyouts are made available in areas in a really holistic way where that person who gets a buyout isn't immediately going to move into a high flood risk area all over again. Um, I'm gonna really pivot here um, and, and I'm gonna pivot to the emission side. Um, so some of you may know that in 2020, uh, right before the world change, about a week before the NBA canceled its season and uh, Tom Hanks got COVID. For me, those are the two thresholds of where the pandemic started. Uh, the, the governor announced uh, the Climate Initiatives Task Force. Um, and then that process really evolved over the last couple of years. Um, governor Edwards said, we can't keep expecting the federal government to make investments in Louisiana to support us in coastal restoration and adaptation if we're not also willing to mitigate our emissions that are causing climate change and contributing to global climate change in a way that really impacts Louisianans. Um, and so he said we need to uh, implement an emissions mitigation plan to get to net zero. Uh, by 2050 uh, and create, what, what does that look like? He, he brought together a task force, um, lots of folks from environmental groups, community groups, and industry groups all together on one um, interestingly comprised team to figure out what those pathways are uh, to get us to our emissions reduction. Um, I wanna pause here because Louisiana's greenhouse gas emissions, we, our, our emissions profile is very different from other states. Other states, most of their greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, all the cars they have on the road or all the buildings that they uh, have. Um, in, in Louisiana, 66% of our emissions come from the industrial sector, come from uh, the refineries, come from oil and gas production, come from the petrochemical facilities. And then within that, 50% of those emissions come from power generated for the industrial sector. So actually like the natural gas to keep the petrochemical facility running, right? Um, and so I wanna, I wanna flag that because that means necessarily Louisiana's path to get to net zero 
probably looks very different than lots of other states. And that means less of the, if I can just be candid, shenanigans where we as individuals are supposed to solve this climate crisis, right? Where if I just choose, if me personally, if I choose to recycle, if I choose to not drive, if I choose to not fly on a plane, if I choose to get rid of my gas stove, which I like might die for, right? Um, it's like, like, which is unfair. In Louisiana, it is not a question of individual choice. This is a question of regulation. This is a question of policy. We are not making sure that our industry is required to decarbonize. Um, and that is a very complicated issue, but I just want to acknowledge it because a lot of people in Louisiana tend to go, we can't ask industry to do anything, they'll leave. <laughs> they have all the jobs, which we could have a whole other conversation about whether or not that is statistically true. Um, <laughs> these are questions of regulation. These are questions of policy. Um, Louisiana, if it continues to permit every single new facility that's already been proposed for our state, and let me just say this graphic is already probably out of date, um, then we're going to see our emissions uh, almost double back way up into this light gray area. Um, if we actually start reducing our emissions, we can get to net zero and we can do through uh, to do it through a range of solutions. Um, the climate task force proposed three critical pathways. Uh, for getting to net zero, um, vast expansion of renewables, accommodating, um, upgrading the grid, the transmission system and distribution system so that it not only can withstand a Hurricane Ida, uh, but so that it also can accommodate and take on uh, new solar and wind. If you think of a grid system like a highway, um, you know, right now our grid system is designed to have huge on ramps in one place right next to a natural gas facility as opposed to lots of little roads you can turn onto for everybody's house who has rooftop solar or every every road where you could be pulling in wind energy uh, from offshore or from onshore. Um, so there's a lot of questions, a lot of work to do around um, renewables and grid upgrades. Um, I wanna acknowledge that in the state, because of our emissions profile, um, there are also a lot of questions around decarbonizing the existing industry industry that we have. And, and while that is happening, uh, there are a lot of expanded proposals to increase our emissions while rationalizing um, those increases of emissions um, with new technologies like low and no carbon hydrogen, which I'll talk very briefly about also. Um, these are the sort of pathways in the climate task force that get us to that net zero strategy. So you'll see some things are in transportation, maintaining our wetlands and our forested areas because they automatically pull carbon dioxide from the air. Um, how do we center um, inclusive economies and economic opportunities so that people are able to, people with resources are more able to adapt. So what does it mean to center Louisiana people and how we create opportunity? Um, and then there are huge questions around industrial decarbonization and clean energy transition. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about uh, a set of technologies that lots of folks on this call will surely have heard about because of um, potentially the controversy around uh, air products, blue hydrogen proposed plant in the Lake Maurepas area or other uh, facilities that have been proposed all over the coast of Louisiana. I'm going to briefly exp explain just what carbon capture is. So uh, carbon uh, capture is essentially, it can be done in two ways. One, either capturing uh, the carbon that is emitted from smokestacks. So you see this diagram from the Nature Conservancy. Um, instead of that carbon dioxide going up into the air, um, pulling that from smokestacks and then transporting it uh, across a facility or across thousands of miles, it could go either way. And then the idea, uh, the plan is that you would um, force it underground into the geologic substructure, thousands of uh, feet underground, usually five to 8,000 feet. Um, and then it would stay there forever, right, is the, is the, is the proposal. Um, I am sure that lots of folks on this call and including myself have lots of questions about the viability of that. And I wanna say, it has not been proven at the scale at which it's being proposed in Louisiana, and you should have lots of questions around it. Um, right now, uh, the state is really uh, across the board, across Democrats and Republicans, people are very supportive of carbon capture. Um, and there are a lot of communities that are really pushing back on new facilities that are being proposed in their areas, especially around Lake Maurepas. 
um, uh, but across the state. Um, this is, I want to uh, say, you know, um, Environmental Defense Fund at a global scale um, thinks that there is some role for uh, these technologies in getting to net zero. Um, and there's a tension <laughs> between um, that uh, institutional decision at a global level and what that means on the ground in a place with real communities and real projects and real regulators and real investors um, and uh, people who may or may not be willing to monitor or enforce, um, which we know very well in the state of Louisiana. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that I am existing in that tension I just described um, uh, because I, I personally have a lot of questions around this um, and EDF is, is doing what we can institutionally to ensure um, that every single safeguard and guardrail um, and regulation are put in place um, as uh, many of these projects are proposed in our communities um, in Louisiana and Texas in particular, but across the country. Um, I want to flag a report that was uh, put out from uh, the Louisiana Against False Solutions Coalition. Um, these are where those proposed facilities and storage sites are located. You will note that some of these red areas um, are some of our most pristine wetlands that still exist, right, um, that have not already been uh, degraded by industry. And so I want to acknowledge that the places where industry seems to be wanting to put these uh, are the places that um, are still vibrant cypress forests, right? Um, and so there's a lot of questions and interrogation uh, that needs to be done across the state of Louisiana. I want to also then pivot uh, because another place uh, uh, where we need to reduce our emissions is on our existing oil and gas infrastructure. Um, these are wells across the state of Louisiana that are idling um, under the premise of future utility. So these are oil or gas wells, mostly oil, that were drilled 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, um, and that are not currently producing oil, um, but that are just idling. Uh, we have data that illustrates that if a well has been idling for more than three years, that well is never coming back online and selling anything to market. Um, and so the state of Louisiana um, is currently actually taking steps to try to reduce this. Um, the Office of Conservation actually put a role in the state register earlier this week. Um, this is a key area where we're working, but I want to flag this um, because managing our, again, regulation and policy uh, to mitigate emissions of our upstream, uh, midstream, and, and sort of refining capacity oil and gas uh, is a huge place where Louisiana can reduce its emissions and needs to take steps to do so. Um, I'm bringing us back uh, to this place at the end of the river. Um, I, uh, For those of you who know me, you know that I am um, constantly bouncing back and forth between all of the existential questions that we all are dealing with and what that looks like both on the emissions mitigation side as well as on um, how I adapt, how we adapt as my community, my family across South Louisiana. Um, and I want to remind us of something because this is kind of a lot all at once um, and I, I realize that I'm throwing a lot at everybody. Um, and I, I'm also struck uh, when I get pulled into conversations at a national level about like why Louisianans would still want to live where we live, um, which are, you know, frustrating and adorably condescending conversations for the most part. Um, you know, <laughs> there's so much value to this place. Um, there's so much that we know and love and cherish in, and, and obviously across, um, you know, our culture and our communities, our food, <laughs> our music, um, you know, our ability to recane chairs, love that. Um, and, and there's also things when people think about Louisiana's impacts from sea level rise that uh, like we're never going to have a problem getting access to drinking water in Louisiana when you look at this map. Um, there are places across the country that are already facing that question because of drought from climate change. Um, you know, in Louisiana, people know how to fill up their bathtub before the storm gets there. So if the water pressure drops, you can flush your toilet or what food to keep out of the freezer and what beverages to have alongside it um, so that when uh, your power goes out, you don't have to open the fridge or the freezer for days and you can just use the ice chests or what to keep in your go bag that's waterproof in case you have to go um, in the middle of a event. And I just, 
kind of want to remind us, like when I look at the scale of the river and the scale of the challenge that we're facing, I also just like I'm constantly inspired by the wisdom and creativity of the people of Louisiana. Um, and I just want to appreciate all of you for putting all of the time and energy into uh, this effort and um, and I guess remind us all that there's uh, there's a fertile land amidst all of this magnitude of things. Um, and so with that, I will stop presenting. <laughs> thank you, thank Jonathan. You so no, thank you so much for that, Liz. And I, I definitely, I think I speak for the whole group in saying um, thank you for choosing to be here and, and the work that you do because um, we all benefit from it. And thank you for that. So um, if anyone has any uh, question um, or comment that you would like to make, um, please raise your hand virtually as Dr. LaFleur has just done. Yes, Gary. Uh, thanks, Liz. That was awesome. I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the, the recent, that, that, that you showed us data that a lot of us haven't seen, you know, so it's some, some of it's brand new data. So I appreciate that. And I was looking at that map that you were showing that was created by the data center, but then, and my question is a little bit of an academic question. I was wondering, did EDF ask the data center to create that or has the data center published that one that shows a few of the parishes and where people move to? Is that publicly available or is that just for you? I would need to look back. Um, there is publicly available information from this report. EDF was not involved in it. Um, I was when I was at the Foundation for Louisiana. The Foundation for Louisiana gave a grant to the data center to support their population migration analysis. Excuse me. Since then, they have scaled up that work, Gary, um, and, and I think have gotten funding from the National Academy of Sciences to do more on coastal migration. Um, and so these are probably not the best maps and, and Robbie uh, Havens at the data center would probably be like, Liz, why are you still showing those? They're so old. Um, and uh, they are doing more work on this. Um, and so happy to connect you. But um, the data center is, I think, increasingly focused on uh, the amount of ongoing migration that there is in the state. I'll also offer that like even with all the population movement in southern Louisiana, um, there's a trend that illustrates like North Louisiana is still losing more population uh, than South Louisiana. And so uh, there's a lot of questions around like economic opportunity and what actually keeps people in place that are, are tied to these questions of disaster um, and, and, and forced migration from climate change. And for me, that's what gets back to that like risk tolerance and risk preference question. Um, because I think where we in our communities are grew up facing certain risks um, and then are having to combine those with new risks, we might think about those risks differently than other places around the country, around the world that are facing risks they've never experienced in their lives or in the generations that came before them. Um, and I think it's I think it's just muddier um, than than uh, some of the academics that are, are doing sort of population movement analysis in a vacuum. I think it's just muddier than than what what folks are currently thinking about. Thanks. Any other questions um, for Liz or any comments? Well, one of the things that, that I recently had a conversation about the carbon capture sequestration, um, we discussed this a little bit in our last gathering and the idea of liquid CO2 being pumped down into the earth and remaining in liquid form. And then, you know, in the future of some, and, and when we talk about the future, if that's 500 years from now, a thousand years from now, there's some seismic activity that takes place would it release that carbon in one large event to create some kind of mass extinction on the planet? You know, for even if humans are no more and there's a new dominant species, you know, we're really thinking far into the future. But then someone else mentioned to me that when it's pumped in that far down, it binds with the rock or it binds with something that's there and it turns into a solid to where it's not able to come back up in any kind of seismic 
um, activity. Did you hear, do you hear anything about that? So, so I appreciate the question. I'm not a technical expert here. I want to acknowledge that, but, I, but my understanding um, is that it can still move or, like it can, it's not solid underground. Okay. It is, um, it can see if the, if the geologic pore space is not completely um, closed or secure, it could seep um, through crevices. For me, that's that's actually why I put the orphan well slide right after the carbon capture slide, uh, because uh, the existing well population in the state of Louisiana is one of the biggest vulnerabilities for our state. Um, so industry is really saying like, and and I would say the Biden administration, the Edwards administration, Senator Cassidy, like lots of folks who are supportive of these technologies are saying. Um, Louisiana has the right geology for this because there's all these salt um, cavities and there's all these geologic layers that have given us fossil fuels that are just waiting to take this CO2. Um, the biggest vulnerability, I think, geologically from our from our subsurface scientists that I work with and lawyers is is the existing well population and that those all of those wells could, if not properly managed or monitored, could act as straws. Um, for the CO2 to essentially escape over time. I can't really answer the hypothetical seismic question. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I will say like, I wanna, I wanna acknowledge that the question of how to decarbonize industry is a really important one. And all of this does go back to questions of like consumption, like how much energy and materials are we trying to use um, and are we trying to grow perpetually and does capitalism just support perpetual growth and like is that even possible and all of that like the notion these but if you just look at individual facilities like the emissions from a steel manufacturing plant are really hard to abate you can't manufacture steel easily by using renewables it's it doesn't get hot enough to do so um, and so if we want to mitigate the emissions of those facilities um, carbon capture is the solution that's being proposed. If, if the conversation that was being had at the state level were like, what are the very specific set of facilities that we can't mitigate through other means? And how do we address those facilities? Like, maybe there would be a lot of thought there. What That's not what is currently being talked about, right? The conversation is how do we move forward every single facility as quickly as possible because there is the promise of some kind of jobs right um, an economic benefit and we've been sold that story before um, and so like we're just seeing a gold rush in louisiana um, chasing after federal tax credits for these without any regard for what industries need to be decarbonized what geographies have already been overburdened and don't need any more industry because this will inevitably expand footprints and extend lifespans of existing facilities um, you know, there, there are just a lot of questions that no one is really even asking. Um, and, and it feels like people are generally in the, this is the worst thing in the world, we cannot do anything of it ever, or this is everything and it's the best thing in the world and we're gonna do all of it. And it's, it, there's like no one in, in the middle and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, and uh, is, it, is it Louisiana's responsibility to decarbonize the world? which is what we're being told we should do it, like i don't we've we've borne a lot of the brunt of industrial development maybe it's not louisiana's turn again yeah 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 thank you elizabeth for sharing louisiana against false solutions i'm trying to navigate a tightrope <laughs> um so we have uh three more questions or comments and then we'll move forward um i would like to say if you um would like to talk more about this please stick around after one o'clock when we have our informal sharing um so uh we've got sarah amanda and then christina so sarah uh, your question or comment please just pointing out that in the chat we have some questions if you want to maybe get one of those and then we can move on to Amanda, because we do have, uh, Ms. Jean has put something, um, it's been there for a bit. Okay, um, let's go to Amanda and then Maida, if you can help us with that question. Um, we'll go that way. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Amanda. Hi. Um... Oh, Amanda, you're on mute. If you can unmute yourself, please. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, okay. thanks. Um, so I'm writing a, or trying to write an article about the 
things that you were talking about in the first half of your presentation, Liz, and building off of, um, I think it was Gary's question, is it even, do you think it's even possible to sort of disentangle the factors of movement, like in terms of, you know, people being displaced by disasters versus the economy, COVID, and like, it, it's very muddied, you said, is it possible to even distinguish those separate factors at this point? In terms of what's affecting people's decision to migrate? Yes, yeah. Um, I would say y'all should invite Robbie Havens to join you on another <laughs> presentation and he can talk through more of what's illustrated in data. I think um, there's a there's another question though that's like more anecdotal, right? And I think for me, this was what was important in LA Safe um, was that you know, some folks would say like, I'm never moving, like I'm gonna die right where I am, but my kids have already left. Um, or I want them to move a few towns up because I want them to have this other set of opportunities that I can't get here anymore. Um, and I think those those stories, like that's different for every single person and every single family to some extent. And the insurance crisis is adding a whole other layer to this because like long before the water is at our doorsteps, financial institutions, and insurers are going to be making decisions about whether or not we get loans or mortgages or uh, you know, insurance. Um, and that also has a much more systems level effect on the decisions that people are able to make, uh, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, and then there's other, like, you know, my, my husband and I talk about, do we wanna buy a house in New Orleans? Um, we rent here still um, for lots of reasons because it's, wildly expensive, uh, but do we want to think of a house as a purchase that declines in value from the moment you drive it off the lot, right? Like a car, um, or do we think of it as an investment? This is not something we would pass on to our daughter that would likely have a tremendous value economically, but like we would live and love here until we couldn't anymore. And maybe there's, you know, if you have the capital to do that, like, I mean, these are, these are huge existential um, sure. questions, and and obviously for lots of this uh, for lots of this presentation, you know, and well, I guess the question and answer in particular, like I am talking in my personal capacity. I am the state director at, at EDF, and I navigate lots of policy positions in that vein. And like, I am a resident of Louisiana. I'm from New Orleans. My family is across South Louisiana. Like. I like my favorite thing to do is go be in my camp in the basin like I, you know this is my place and so um i'm i'm grappling with this the same way that lots of us are trying to grapple with it because it's it's real and it's personal at the same time as it's policy questions thank you Maida, do you have that question from the chat and then we'll go to christina and then we can move forward oh you're on mute Maida. uh jean sol has pointed out that uh, she's asking, what do you say to people when they say, I get it, but they need to keep the well-paying job offered by industry? I think there are lots of uh, jobs emerging that are um, candidly to clean up industry's mess. Um, job opportunities in uh, the oil and gas sector are, are to mitigate and cap existing orphaned wells or to mitigate for methane emissions. Um, will be some of those economic opportunities that provide tremendous benefit and where Louisiana people are already skilled to do that. I'd like to see more intentional growth and support of the coastal restoration economy. Um, that was for, for, for residents of LA Safe that participated in LA Safe. The reason for the Bayou Region Incubator um, was to catalyze coastal economies and coastal economic opportunities, mostly tied to coastal restoration. People were like, why are we spending billions of dollars as a state? Um, and, and Louisiana people and Louisiana businesses aren't getting access to those jobs. And so initially the incubator um, was designed to do that. I haven't been super connected with it for a couple of years, so I don't know where it is, but, but I just wanna acknowledge that. There are tremendous, the, near, the story that we only can rely on industry um, I think is is something we need to press on a lot more than than we have. Um, industry isn't going anywhere tomorrow, um, and do we need to keep uh, expanding all of those facilities 
um, that have lots of other health impacts. Louisiana has some of the highest cancer rates in the country. Um, it, what, what are the trade-offs that we're all being asked to navigate? Um, because there are lots of jobs that can also uh, create wealth for families um, and, and uh, just looking to things that are also doing us harm um, doesn't go far enough. Christina, and, and then we'll move forward. Hi, Ellis, thank you for um, showing and, and giving the examples of how complex this is. Um, very, very good with all the maps and illustrations. Uh, something that you mentioned in your presentation as far as the, everybody being able to get a glass of water. <laughs> uh, with uh, We've seen some new models with uh, the different types of drought conditions uh, uh, in North America. Um, throughout the whole continent and talking to some floodplain experts on what they're expecting with water flow with rivers and so forth. Uh, and it uh, looks very precarious. And so at this point, as in the conversation, uh, the uh, Texas has a conglomerate that wants to buy water out of the Sabine um, uh, out of the Sabine River over Texas, uh, Louisiana border, uh, Toledo Bend Reservoir. And they're wanting to buy massive amount of water for Dallas. Um, as we were talking to the, the folks with the floodplain, uh, we found that um, in the Great Lakes area, the uh, states in that area have uh, created um, legislation to protect the water in their states from extraction. And it might be something that we need to do preemptively to protect all of our water in Louisiana before that becomes the next extraction like oil and gas and everything yeah. else. Yeah, um, the Tulane Water Resources Law and Policy Center has been doing some work on that, Christina, for years. Um, Chris Dalbum is taking over from Mark Davis. Uh, but. I know that this question has been something they've been doing research on and mulling over for years and like what would a water code for Louisiana look like um, that navigates some of those complexities. I, I haven't seen a lot of that work lately, um, and this is not an area that EDF is currently engaged in, but um, I definitely would encourage you to follow up with them and and again I think you know there are lots of questions like the Sabine and Calcasieu system is is sort of even different than. The Mississippi system, which seems to have like so much water that like maybe it wouldn't matter. We could sell water from there. And there's a whole other set of questions there too, right? Around coastal restoration and like what is the water used for? And like how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in it from all the agricultural runoff from the center of the country? And who has to mitigate that? Like, I mean, it is all of these, all of these policy worlds are so complicated because we're not starting with a fresh slate, right? We're starting with decades and generations of decisions, decades and generations of decisions that included decisions that valued some people more than others, decisions that if we're not intentional about dismantling inequities will, however, unintentionally or intentionally exacerbate those inequities. Um, and so it's just, um, I don't mean to in any way make anybody more frustrated or, or disappointed with that reality, but like the policy landscape that we exist in um, is is its own minefield on any topic area, um, and so again, like I I do my I, I I am I am loving being inside of an organization where on some of the topics in Louisiana I can at least call it's not just me trying to figure out like what's happening and what's the history. There's like a team of um, lawyers and scientists and analysts who are um, able to help us figure out what the policy work looks like. Um, and so happy to collaborate with anybody on any of those topics if we have the expertise. Thank you so much for that, Liz. Um, and now the, the next thing that we'd like to ask you is if you could just share with us, what is your hope for the coast? And if there are people on the call who would like to share their hope for the coast, you can uh, please do so in the chat. But um, what's your hope for the coast, Liz? I hope that we um, can appreciate the dynamic nature of the coast um, and that we can reconnect the river to uh, the Delta system and that we can 
thrive in appreciating like the life that comes with that, the sounds of the cicadas and the frogs and the um, bugs that come along with a growing delta. Um, you know, I think like as we've lost land, uh, different marshes sound so different than a healthy ecosystem. Um, and so, and and for me, there's like just like sounds that come along with that. So I guess that my hope is to be able to cherish those the the sounds that come along with that, the people, um, the sounds of the people, the sounds of the wildlife, the sounds of the water, the sounds of, you know, the tugboats, like, even if all of them aren't happy all the time, it's like, uh, I just, I want to appreciate the dynamism. Um, and my hope is that we, we stop seeing things so, like, so, clearly one or the other and like just get more comfortable existing in the tension between things like is the land growing or is it disappearing is it, you know is this right like what is the yes or no it's just like it's muddier than that i guess so my hope is get for comfort in the mud i don't know that's it that's what it is i like it i like it <laughs> Thank you so much for being Thank with us so today and, and sharing all of your insights. Um, it, it's been a, a, a really wonderful um, program. Uh, we hope that everyone will stick around with us. We're going to um, uh, go through a few more slides and a few, a little bit more housekeeping, and then we'll start the informal part of our uh, sharing. So um, here's our position statement. Um, you can sign on as an individual or an organization. Um, you can uh, take a snapshot of those QR codes and we'll take you there. So, so far we have 98 individuals that have signed on and 25 organizations. So um, if you haven't, please take a moment uh, to check out that information. Um, we've got uh, some information on our working group. So the French language preservation um, working group meeting on Tuesday. July 25th um, on Zoom at two. Uh, do we have anybody from the group who would like to give an update real quick? Yes. Um, so we are meeting uh, this coming Tuesday on Zoom. Uh, our convener is David Sheremy. We have his email address on a slide coming up. So you can email him. Um, he was traveling and so he is not with us today, but we are planning an in-person summit and the plan for now um, is that it will be on October 7th. So it's the first weekend in October and it'll be at the West Baton Rouge Museum. Um, and our goals for the summit are to discuss ways that we can generate more data and create uh, maps like the ones that Liz showed us about the about French speaking populations in the state. Um, we're interested in economic incentives for um, uh, increasing access to French education. Um, and preservation as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. We appreciate that that update. Um, and we've got the Culture and Coastal Planning Working Group that meets uh, Thursday, August third at one p.m. They meet uh, twice a month. Uh, they're currently focusing on cemeteries and cultural landscapes. Uh, preparing receiving communities um, meets on Thursdays at eleven monthly. I think we may have Haley or Tracy with us. Um, if y'all would like to give an update on that. Maybe not. Okay. Um, oh, hi, everyone. <laughs> so oh, hey, hey, Tracy. We're both here sitting right okay. next to each other trying to <laughs> figure out who's going to actually speak. Um, so we're meeting once a month um, uh, on Thursdays at 11, um, and we are going to start a speaker series. So during our meetings, we're going to have somebody come. Um, our kind of goals moving forward is to really be thinking about um, kind of doing foundational research and then how to put strategies together that might help Louisiana communities. And so we're going to invite um, guest speakers. Some people on this call might get a, a, a email from us asking you to come and talk. Um, but but just thinking how you know our interests might become something that's tangible and helpful for communities. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then Artists and Tradition Bears, third Tuesdays at six. Next meeting is uh, Tuesday, August 15th. I'm not sure if uh, Lauren is here and can give an update. I'm not sure um, if Lauren's with us or not. But, all right. Um, so here is the information. If you would like to participate in one of the working groups, we've got um, the convener's emails here. 
Um, you can also go to louisianafolklore.org for more information. We hope that you'll all join us um, next month on Friday, August 25th at noon. Um, we'll have Jennifer Blanchard with us, who is a botanist and instructor of horticulture and medicinal plants over at LSU. Um, she will be presenting Louisiana Medicinal Plants, Folkways Look Forward, uh, Look Toward the Future. Uh, so we'll hope, hopefully you'll be with us again. Uh, and uh, because of the time, uh, we'll move forward. If you have any announcements, we hope that you'll stay with us for the informal uh, part of our conversation and you can um, share your announcements there. Um, and we'll be here until 1.30. Again, these are ways that you can connect with us through Facebook and Instagram. Also um, on the website, louisianafolklore.org. And so that concludes the formal part of our presentation. Again, we hope that you'll uh, stick around if you have any other questions uh, for Liz or would like to um, discuss any other topics.